The dawn of a new decade saw Jack Brabham win the 1959 and 1960 World Drivers' Championships. So Jack's breakthrough challenged overseas perceptions of Australia as a backwater. While at home, there was a growing confidence and increasing desire to cut free from a very British past. With only 45 miles to go, 15 laps, Moz had to change a wheel, a delay fatal to his winning chance. Little to fear now, Brabham had the race in his pocket, though Sterling Moss was still giving chase. Jack Brabham won, covering the 225 miles at an average of just under 90 miles an hour. Someone said to Michael Schumacher back in the days when he was very dominant with the Ferrari, they were saying, someone, it might have been an Australian journalist, said, yes, this is all very impressive, Michael, winning all these world championships, but imagine if you had also designed the car and had your name on it. And it really sort of put it in perspective because it was like, yeah, even by today's standards, just look at what Jack did in 1966. It's just extraordinary. This confidence was further boosted by a growing US influence from what soon became known as the Big Three. Ford and Chrysler in Australia joining GM Holden to represent one of the few automotive industries in the world that could design and build cars from scratch. General Motors Holden's is pretty big business up this way now, with a modern, well-equipped factory in very pleasant surroundings. In the Elizabeth factory alone, over 1,500 people are employed on two shifts, and shortly, this factory will cover one million square feet of working area. While the family sedan market became the battleground for the big three, they also continued to offer locally assembled versions of US imports for well-heeled Australians, many of whom were still riding off the sheep's back or enjoying the fruits of Australia's farming exports. There were Chevrolets, Pontiacs, Ford Galaxies and the Dodge Phoenix, along with various British and European small and mid-size models. Holden's early 1960s release of the FB and EK showed somewhat dated US 1950s styling influences that would need to be updated in the face of stiffer competition from Ford and later Chrysler. This resulted in the adoption of a more contemporary look. Now you've seen it, why not call in at your nearest Holden dealer and have a really good look at this wonderful new Holden. The first Australian-made Falcon, the XK, rolled off the Broadmeadows assembly line in 1960, followed by the XL in 1962 and the XM in 1964. Introducing the 1964 Ford Falcon. Falcon was certified golden quality. Tougher, more durable than ever before, with a bold new look of leadership. Falcon for 64. Every part of the new Falcon is built to golden quality standards. Yet it is priced down to the lowest priced six cylinder car in Australia. And they almost were going down the path of looking at the Zephyr as the mainstay vehicle for Ford. Uh, but at the last minute, they saw the new Falcon, the XK Falcon, the American Falcon design, which was a compact car in the US, but it was ideal for a family car in Australia to go up against the, the Holden. In 1962, Chrysler Australia released a very popular locally assembled version of the US Plymouth Valiant, the R-Series, followed later by the S. January 1962, we have the R-Series Valiant. Now that car changed the way the game was played in this country overnight. For 
1200 and something pounds for the manual, so about 120 pounds more than your Holden Special or your Ford Falcon Deluxe, you could buy yourself an R-Series Valiant. With that drop-dead gorgeous styling, 145 horsepower, and near enough 100 miles an hour off the showroom floor. And for whatever reason, and I don't really know the answer to this, the Australians could only get 1,008 CKD packs out of the Americans. Well, they were sold in five minutes. Then along comes the S series, and again, sell out. Could not get enough. Based on this success, the Australian-designed AP5 soon followed, with Chrysler establishing new assembly and engine plants in Adelaide. Not to be outdone, Holden launched its very popular EH in 1964. New beauty, new elegance, new power-swept styling, new value throughout, yet still the lowest price six-cylinder car. Get behind the wheel of the new Holden. Another famous US brand, Studebaker, also briefly established a local assembly line. The apron strings of Mother Britain were wearing ever thinner as Australia adopted a more American outlook on life. The 1950s and 60s is the period of the great baby boom. And our picture of life in that period is, is one of mum and dad in the front seat and the kids in the back touring the countryside. You could hitch a, a caravan on the back and you traveled the country in a way that Australians, I think, had seldom done before. The Ford Falcon came in in 1960 and completely changed the scene in Australia. And from that point on, there was a battle between the big three to gain ascendancy. The early 1960s also saw an easing of import restrictions on vehicles from outside the Commonwealth. This encouraged more marks from Europe and Japan. The release of British Motor Corporation's innovative yet low price Mini in 1961 proved not only an ideal first car for early baby boomers, it also helped to create a whole new market, the second family car. I don't think the BMC people thought it was going to be a, a very big seller. Um, because it had those tiny 10 inch wheels on it, had about three gallons in the tank in the back, which meant if you drove over the Sydney Harbour Bridge and came back again, you're probably going to be out of fuel. Um, the gear shift on it was absolutely atrocious. Um, and the noise inside the car was unbelievable. But it struck a nerve with young hippie type people that this was the car to have. So, um, it very quickly became a, a best seller. So. Yeah, throughout the 50s and 60s, the car, the ownership of the family car, really unshackled women from the kitchen, uh, from the suburban block, and it gave them the freedom to go out, to start working, to take the kids out, to do things for themselves. However, the Japanese would soon dominate both segments. In 1960, Sir Lawrence Hartnett secured local distribution rights for imported Datsun cars and later local assembly. In 1963, Toyota teamed up with AMI in Port Melbourne to produce the Tiara. And Mitsubishi, sharing its Adelaide plant with Chrysler, started assembly of the Colt a year later. Uh, the Japanese looked at the Australian market really as a test market in many ways. We were a relatively low volume market, low population of course, and before they embarked on larger markets like the United States and Europe, they saw Australia as being an opportunity to understand Western tastes, Western styles, and how they could develop not only the design of the car and engineering of the car, but dealer networks, the whole process of selling, designing, selling automobiles. Volkswagen Australia achieved full local manufacture of the Beetle in its Clayton plant in Melbourne, complete with a kangaroo proudly stamped on each locally made part. By 1962, it was Australia's third largest manufacturer behind Holden and Ford. Don't have a worry, have a Volkswagen. Well, the Beetle's success, you know, the success it had in Australia, it was happening all around the world. It was extraordinary, that car. But in Australia, it particularly you know, hit a sweet spot with a lot of Australians. Keep in mind that back in those days, the 50s and the 60s, most roads in Australia were dirt. There wasn't nearly as much bitumen as we had today. Roads were rough. People needed cars that were simple, easy to maintain, reliable, they could go across rugged terrain. And the Beetle came along and it could just do all those things so effortlessly and so easily. And it just captured the imagination of the public. 
Melbourne also became home to Renault Australia, selling locally assembled versions of popular Renault and Peugeot models. The growing appeal of touring car racing saw the establishment of a national set of rules, an official touring car championship and a new annual race at Phillip Island called the Armstrong 500 to showcase the durability of locally available cars in standard showroom trim. To conform with regulations, every vehicle must be standard, as sold to you and subject to ARDC scrutiny before and after. When the 500-mile race moved to Bathurst in 1963, it would play a pivotal role in the Australian car industry. And the legend of Bathurst was born. All set, get ready, go! When the race started to get some momentum and people started to realise just how influential the result was starting to become, uh, a lot of car manufacturers, both local and overseas like importers started to focus a lot of their marketing activities around Bathurst because they realised in just the same way that the Red X trials of the early 50s had impressed people, move it a decade later, Bathurst took over in that role. And it was really, if your car can do well at Bathurst, you know, 500 miles or 800 kilometres, getting the wheels driven off it all day, and it can survive that, then it's instant credibility. It was Bill Burke, hand-picked by Ford Australia boss Wallace Booth to be his new marketing and sales manager, who arrived from Canada in February 1965, one month before the HD Holden and XP Falcon launched. Almost immediately, Burke initiated his risky 70,000-mile durability run at Ford's new proving ground in the Yuyang Ranges of Victoria. This was all to prove the new Falcon's suitability for Australian conditions after the earlier XK model struggled with suspension failures. I think the early Falcons were quite nicely styled personally, but, but I don't think technically, engineeringly, they were built for Australia. So they used to, they gave a bit of trouble. It takes a while to overcome that sort of reputation. The average speed was to be 70 miles per hour, or 110 kilometres per hour. But no one knew if this was even possible on the narrow, hilly, tortuous track that was designed for speeds of about 60 kilometres an hour. Competition's boss, Les Powell, was put in charge and he shrewdly chose race and rally ace Harry Firth to prepare the cars and drive along with a large team of racing drivers. 8.28 a.m. Saturday, 24th of April, 1965. Five strictly stock model Falcons, representing both standard and automatic transmission, were flagged away by Mr. Wallace Booth, managing director of Ford Australia. Ahead lay a challenge never before attempted in the history of the automotive industry in the Southern Hemisphere. Company confidence in the Ford Falcon was demonstrated by publicly announcing in advance that five showroom Falcons would together amass a total of 70,000 miles in under nine days and nights. Henry Ford II, grandson of Henry Ford, arrived by helicopter to see this madness for himself and reportedly thought the idea was ludicrous. It was a big career gamble for Burke, but it succeeded. The Falcon's all standard cars, despite most hitting large boulders and some even rolling, completed their 70,000 miles or 110,000 kilometres at 70 miles per hour. It marked the beginning of Falcon's serious challenge to Holden. Ford's confidence is eminently justified. Let's ask that man Les Powell for the company viewpoint. We went out on a limb by saying we would do it. Our aim of 70,000 miles was achieved in under nine days. Those results speak for themselves and they're proof of much more than reliability and endurance. In other words, though we have finished, the story has not. The fact that they achieved that was a turning point for Ford Australia. It saved the Falcon, the XP, proved that it was tough enough for Australian conditions. It got uh, the fleets talking to Ford again. It saved the Falcon and it saved Ford Australia. 
The XP sold strongly and was awarded Wheels Magazine Car of the Year, a huge accolade. But Burke wasn't finished. He launched the bigger, bolder XR Falcon in 1966 with optional V8 engine, rendering Holden's HR a car of yesteryear. To prove the point, Wheels awarded Falcon Car of the Year for the second year running. Ford and Burke were on a roll. But Holden still had the lion's share of the market. Taking on Holden wasn't going to be easy. The time is now. And the car is Holden. Look. Look again. Look closely. The time is now. And the car is Holden, engineered to a new turbo smooth car. By then, Chrysler's Valiant V8 was also doing well. AMI was making Toyota Coronas, and in 1966, with decimal currency replacing pounds, shillings and pence, Press Metal Corporation in Sydney began assembling Datsun Bluebirds. David Mackay was to skipper three Datsun Bluebirds, but they withdrew when practice disclosed wheel nut weakness. Newcomer to World Saloon Car Racing, Japanese Toyota Corona. Foreign cars assembled in Australia were permitted this year, providing 250 had been sold. The Corona is recognised as a serious threat in his class. The Vietnam War brought conscription and we lost a Prime Minister. Harold Holt drowned at Portsea while scuba diving on the 17th of December 1966. Months later, more of Burke's marketing genius manifested itself in the guise of the luxury Fairlane and the first Australian muscle car, the Falcon GT. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, one of the, the great influences, uh, particularly for Ford Motor Company, was Bill Burke. And he uh, was the mastermind behind the Falcon uh, GT, uh, which came out in XR model in 1967. It actually caused Holden to redesign its uh, HK model uh, range. Uh, make it actually a bigger car to go head to head with the Falcon. The car was originally developed as a pursuit special for police forces and then he looked at what, the, what that was offering and thought, wow, you know, we could package this up, right paint jobs, stripes, chrome wheels, that sort of thing, and went and developed the, uh, the XR GT. At Bathurst, the GT wrote its name into Australian history books, starting a new V8 performance culture that lasted for decades. I think by doing those sorts of things, Ford become very big in this motorsport back in the day, and that was good for the public. And all of a sudden the image started with a GT Falcon, and people started to come to Ford and buy Fords. With the space race and an increasing American influence as a background, change continued at pace. Chrysler debuted its VE Valiant, an American-inspired design that won Wheels Car of the Year in 1968. And Holden recovered its mojo with the new generation HK range, offering V8 power, larger bodies and an expanded model range, including a soon-to-be-launched excitement machine, the Holden Monaro. And it was the debut of the much-loved Kingswood nameplate. Holden has a, had a lot to say about what was going on down here in Australia. For example, the Monaro, the original Monaro coupe, uh, that was a two-door coupe, but it had pillarless glass in it. And that was the first car in Australia, the manufactured in volume, that had pillarless, or frameless glass, I should say. The Monaro Coupe astonished the punters, especially the top shelf GDS 327, a brilliant response to the mighty Falcon GT. The Aussie muscle car era had truly arrived. Oh, well, look, I remember when the Holden Monaro won in 1968 and you'd see the two-door taxi version of the Monaro that for all the world was a taxi, but it just happened to be two doors and have a coupe. On the back window, drive a 500 winner. So this is where the idea of win races on Sunday, sell cars on Monday really, really did happen in Australia. Australia's first sports machine, the racy looks of a high-priced Continental rally car, but no fancy foreign price tag. But it wasn't all muscle. In 1968, AMI, assemblers of countless ramblers, 
Triumphs, Mercedes-Benz and more added the Toyota Corolla to its repertoire. The local industry had come of age since the days when Ben Chifley proclaimed the first Holden a beauty. The Japanese had well and truly arrived. Jack Brabham won his third Formula One title in 1966, driving a car of his own design, bearing his own name and powered by an Australian-made Repco V8 engine. This was a glowing testament to our world-class Aussie engineering. Two years later, the Australian motor industry again starred on the international stage when a trio of Ford's new XT Falcon GTs claimed the prestigious team's prize in the London to Sydney Marathon. The marketing suits at Ford built on the Falcon's success. More proof of Falcon's toughness came when it took out the team performance trophy in the London to Sydney Marathon. While Chrysler, which had recently taken ownership of the troubled British Roots Group, were unprepared for the Hillman Hunters' victory, which had come their way as a result of a severe accident by the leading Citroen. First home was the Hillman Hunter of Andrew Cohen and his crew Colin Malkin and Brian Coyne. In third place for Ford of Australia came the Falcon, captained by Ian Vaughan. Prize money, £2,000. Cars were still coming in after the gruelling test. Paddy Hopkirk and his 1800 had battled through into second place to take the well-deserved £3,000 that went with them. They'd come across three continents, battling and beating, often appalling conditions. For them, it was champagne all the way. After 10,000 punishing miles, these were the moments of exhilaration that made all the sweat and heartache so worthwhile. 1969 heralded Chrysler's new VF Valiant range, including the sporty Pacer sedan and Australia's longest two-door hardtop. Government policy to keep making cars in Australia was in full swing, with high import tariffs ensuring not only the big three, but also Japan's stake in local car manufacturing continued to grow. Mitsubishi worked with Chrysler on future shared model programs, Datsun's local assembly with increasing Australian content moved to Clayton, and Toyota took a controlling interest in the AMI operations at Port Melbourne. The future model of Australian car making was really taking shape, just as the government wanted it to. The Corolla, I think, set the scene in the 60s for people to begin to accept uh, Japanese cars as being worth buying. The Datsun 1600 broke new ground in that engineering-wise, it was a beautifully engineered small car, overhead camshaft engine, independent rear suspension. After a succession of popular front-wheel drive models, including the Morris 1100 and Austin 1800, BMC merged with Leyland in 1968. The Australian arm planning to tackle the big three with a full-size family car of its own. The incredible moke goes everywhere. Well, just about. And the moke was made for the countryman. With an east-west engine, power to spare, and front-wheel drive. Hey, look at this driver treated rough. Mini Moke is on display now, just an incredible $1,295 plus delivery. Whilst BMC and Sydney were building Minis, 1100s and 1800s, the company was never ever profitable. Holden moved further from Detroit's control in 1969 with its homegrown V8 and created a new market for compact six-cylinder cars with the Tirana. The hotter XU1 model would become the giant killer to conquer Bathurst. In 1970, two amazing things happened. I was born and Australia manufactured an incredible all-time record of 475,000 new vehicles. That is a lot of cars. Chrysler and racing great Sterling Moss launched the new VG Valiant with its locally made Hemi 6. You see, it's an engine with six hemispherical combustion chambers. These allow petrol to burn more completely, so you can get up to 20% more economy, plus the performance of a V8. I can go on and on about the safety features, the torsion bar suspension, the styling that doesn't lose its value when you trade, oh, all sorts of reasons. But see your Valiant dealer. Let him show you all the right reasons. For all the right reasons. Well, they were heady days, they were innocent days, Nobody could do anything wrong. Uh, there were plenty of lies told in advertising. 
But it was a very clever move for Chrysler Australia to bring Sterling Moss out to promote their their VG Valiant with its new Hemi engine. In 1971, Holden unleashed its new HQ, its boldest and broadest range yet, including the luxurious long wheelbase Statesman and one tonne commercial. Statesman. What makes it different is what makes it better. The smoothness of a four-coil ride, the luxury equipment he chose, the distinctive style and value that goes far beyond price. When a man does his own thinking, he's ahead of the crowd. And you know him by his statesman. Statesman from General Motors. What makes it different is what makes it better. The HQ Holden broke new ground in Australia. Although it was seen to be quite a feminine design, if you looked at the boxy formal designs that had preceded the HQ Holden, the surface development of the HQ Holden, the clarity of design, the lightness of some of the features on the car broke really new ground for Holden. It broke new ground for Australian design. Chrysler launched its own hero, the brilliant two-door coupe called the Charger, including the super-hot RT Hemi 6 track version. And it was launched right across the nation to the sounds of Hey Charger. Hey Charger. Hey Charger. Hey Charger. Hey Charger. The unbelievable can happen to you. You know, I remember my brother on his dragster and me and my on my electric blue scooter riding along and seeing this woman driving a, the latest orange charger and all the kids going, hey, charger. You know, I remember that as clear as day. I mean, that was such a powerful campaign and that really kept Chrysler afloat. Oh, would, would anyone like a lift? <laughs> charger isn't expensive, but that's not the only attraction. Every kid I knew when you were walking home from school, if there was a charger, hey charger! I mean, that was just so brilliantly simple. These were really exciting times. The annual Bathurst 500 captured the public's imagination with a win on Sunday, meaning big sales on Monday. Millions tuned into the live black and white TV coverage as the muscle car war between the big three erupted with the Falcon GDHO, Holden's Monaro and Tirana, as well as Chrysler's Hemi Chargers. Racing drivers Bond, Moffat, Brock and Geegan became household names and Bathurst legends. Toyota and Datsun also embraced the great race to prove they too were tough enough for our Aussie roads and conditions. Long before the Tirana was the giant killer at Bathurst, the Japanese manufacturers, bless their hearts, were using Mount Panorama as their proving ground. So they brought out teams of Coronas with Japanese Harakiri drivers, you know, driving like absolute lunatics, throwing these cars around Mount Panorama like there was no tomorrow and proving that their little Japanese cars were durable. The majority of the public come to see the touring cars, the Mustangs, the Camaros, the, the Holdens, the Falcons and the Valiants, all racing, the cars that they themselves drive and, or see on the roads and the cars that can identify themselves with. There's no question about that. There is no way anyone can compile figures that will show you that they are unpopular with the touring with the spectators of Australia. In 1972, local production of a Mitsubishi designed but Chrysler badged small car, the Galant, was a hint of things to come for the big three, with Holden and Ford destined to forge similar partnerships. One of life's little luxuries. This was also the year Ford launched its new XA Falcon range to wider claim. But times were a changing. A politically motivated, media-driven supercar scare all but killed the Aussie muscle car, whilst the rise in the popularity of Japanese cars now represented more than a third of the Aussie market. Well, the Japanese cars moved into the Australian market on a value for money proposition. Um, they were technically probably more sophisticated than the Australian cars in the sense of their engines, their five-speed transmissions, independent rear suspension. 
The Australian large light car game attracts a lot of overseas players and they all come with a reputation for a high level of standard equipment. When all the cards have been put on the table, new Ford TD Cortina. Going forward is the going thing. Room to pack it all up and go. And have a look at the inside story. Room to move. And stretch out. All around. Wide, comfortable seats. It's got the lot. And it's a road car. <laughs> if you really enjoy driving, Falcon's what it's all about. As cars got cheaper throughout the 60s and 70s, uh, families started getting two cars and the father would drive the big family truckster into work every day and the mother would take the car to the shopping centre or drive the kids to school. Um, so it certainly gave her a great degree of freedom in, and independence. Remembering that in the early 1970s, Australia went through, like the rest of the world, a fuel crisis. And, and gradually people realised that these four-cylinder cars, or small capacity cars generally, actually perform very well. On the 2nd of December 1972, Australian voters decided it's time for the first Labor government in 23 years. Under Gough Whitlam, change came rapidly in foreign affairs, education, industry policy and many other areas. The period starting in 19, late 1972 with the arrival of Gough Whitlam in the big chair in Canberra, not long after he was voted in as Prime Minister of this country, he started messing with the tariff system, which meant any vehicle that Chrysler, Ford, Holden, BMC, Volkswagen were exporting suddenly became 30% more expensive tomorrow than what they were yesterday. Time for Labor, but not Leyland Australia. After the failure of its homegrown Austin X6 Tasman Kimberley range, management decided that if it could not beat the big three, it may as well join them. Enter the P76 in 1973. One of the car's advertised attributes was that it could carry a 44-gallon drum in the boot. But despite advertising hype about it being anything but average, Peter Werrett, who hosted Australia's and one of the world's first primetime motoring TV shows, Talk, said if ever he had seen an average car, this was it. But... If you ask me, I reckon it's just what every Aussie needed. A 44-gallon drum in your boot. The first six months of production, the quality, I would have to admit, was pretty ordinary because the people on the line had never built a car like that before. So once they got the quality issue sorted out, the last 12 months of production, those cars were as well made as the Holdens, Fords and Chryslers of their day. As a car to drive, um, the V8 Leyland P76 with an automatic gearbox was a sweet car to drive. It really was. In contrast, Wheels magazine awarded it Car of the Year, but only the V8 variants. In a nutshell, the P76 was underfunded and its bold design poorly implemented. The Sydney factory was not set up to produce large cars, Along with union unrest, the P76 soon gained a reputation for poor quality. Its inevitable failure led Leyland Australia to end local manufacturing in 1974. And the promising 47V coupe died with it. This was the end of Leyland Australia. I remember the engineers, our engineers, assessing the car and they thought it, mechanically it was quite a good car. The execution of the design was rather poor um, from a manufacturing point of view. The design wasn't sensational, but it was a good package, had a lot of good things going for it. Meanwhile, young Aussies were choosing vans as escape machines. A surf culture took over, starting with the 1974 Holden Sandman, then the Falcon Sundowner, and later the Valiant Drifter. There were even smaller models like the Escort Little Ripper and Holden Gemini Gypsy Panel Van. If this vehicle's rockin', don't bother knockin', said one popular rear window sticker. And another one was, don't laugh, your daughter may be inside. Oh yeah. This made fathers nervous from Broadbeach to Bunbury.
with a surfboard in the back. The panel van is just so iconically Australian. You know, funnily enough, I think that the double mattress fits perfectly in the back of a Sandman. And I reckon the car was built around the mattress, not the mattress built around the car. There is nothing like the Sandman today. It was a symbol of freedom. It was a symbol of Australian beach way of life. Fathers didn't like it, but the girls still, sure loved it. That was just an extraordinary era, the, uh, the, the panel van era. Um, and it became so big that the, uh, the car manufacturers really embraced it with special models like the Sandman, you know, the Chrysler Drifter, the Falcon Sundowner. It was, uh, it was incredible, the whole surfy culture, and it, it drew the whole Australian car manufacturer, the big three, with it. At the other end of the sophistication scale, Ford Australia introduced its plush LTD and Landau twins in 1973. Up until now, Australians have always assumed that imported cars have had the edge over locally manufactured models. Tonight, Ford Australia are about to challenge that assumption with the release of the Ford LTD and the Ford Landau, the first true luxury cars ever totally designed and developed in Australia. The LTD being an even stretchier version of the popular Fairlane, while the Landau was the ultimate Falcon hardtop. Australia's most distinguished motor cars, Ford LTD, Ford Landau, awaiting your inspection now at your Ford dealer. The Holden Kingswood was still a big hit with Australians, but the new XB Falcon was also flourishing, while the once prestigious Valiant was losing ground. Size it up, because when you size it up, Ford Falcon fits you. You've still got an eye for a good figure, even when it's your wife's. It's a matter of style and Falcon's got it. That's why Falcon suits your style of life. Size it up, size it up, because when you size it up, Ford Falcon fits you. Fairlanes had become the darlings of corporate managers, farmers and real estate agents, selling way ahead of the statesman and Chrysler by Chrysler. And Jeffrey Ellis talks about Ford Fairlane. I cover a large country area, travelling about 50 to 60,000 miles a year. Ride qualities are excellent. I push Fairlane over paddocks, rough roads and drive it back on the bitumen and feel I've just been around the block. It's funny, I remember as a kid, you know, if you go into a country town, you drive past the real estate agent and almost certainly there'd be a fair lane parked out the front. You know, and even Ford would run its advertising, you know, the old uh, will pin a pound, you know, and the guy would say, oh, this is my third fair lane. And, and I had friends, you know, who, fathers who, you know, they had five, six, seven fair lanes, one after the other, just update them. And Ford had a huge share of that market. And again, that was very influential in terms of then dictating policy for fleets. In 1974, Holden launched the compact LH Tirana, partly in response to the increasing popularity of Japanese cars. The Tirana was one of few cars anywhere in the world to offer a four or six cylinder plus V8 engine. Despite being planned as an economy model, the LH Tirana finished up costing almost as much as a Kingswood. Ford and Chrysler offered mid-sized models such as the Cortina and Centura, yet traditional buyers stayed with their big cars. It was the buyers seeking smaller models that became increasingly infatuated by the Japanese cars. The LH Tirana SLR 5000 and Racing L34 edition essentially replaced the Monaro, and the last Monaro coupe body shells were used for the up-spec LE in 1976. In response to the Arab oil embargo that spiked fuel prices, the little Holden Gemini launched in 1975 and sold strongly, as did Chrysler's Galant, but the Japanese competition was intensifying. Yep, from the 1st of July 1976, performance became a dirty word as the anti-emissions legislation sapped economy and performance. The old 3.3 litre Holden 6 was among the hardest hit and the new HX series suffered poor running, overheating and by God, lousy fuel economy. <laughs> what had happened? The 1976 arrival of the Alex Tirana saw the release of an attractive new hatchback body style with an optional tent for overnight stays, which was called, wait for it, the Hatch Hutch. 
And by late in the year, the four-cylinder Sunbird was the first Holden to be equipped with radial tuned suspension, a long overdue upgrade that also found its way into the rest of the Holden range, delivering European handling. Now, all Tiranas are equipped with radial tuned suspension, and that means the car goes right where you point it. Watch me straight in this corner. Radial tune suspension gives you positive handling and on the road accuracy. The hatchback on the, on the Tirana was the first hatchback made here. It really started off as a notchback car, uh, just with a conventional deck lid. And one of our uh, hold and managing directors was back in the States and he saw the Chevy Vega, which was General Motors' first hatchback. And he came back to Australia and the Tirana was about three quarters done, already cutting steel. And for the for as a conventional deck lid, and he says, "No, nope, we got to change that to a hatchback." And they tore the, from the number two pillar back. They tore up the whole car and redid it. And it probably got a pretty good expense to make the first hatchback. Ford launched the XC Falcon, the third and final facelift of the XA launched five years earlier. The slow-selling two-door hardtops went out in a blaze of glory, with Alan Moffat and Colin Bond staging an unprecedented 1-2 formation finish at Bathurst in 1977, giving Ford its greatest victory of all. The following year, Ford would cleverly clear remaining stocks of its hardtop bodies with the limited edition Falcon Cobra. Even so, its bold blue and white snake bite was no match for the competition variant of the Alex Tirana called the A9X, which swept all before it on the racetrack. For some reason, didn't know about the A9X. That was all going on between Harry Firth and the engineering department. And then one day, uh, I was told that, look, we're going to do this race car. We haven't got time to do any styling stuff on it, but we need a hood scoop. Harry comes in one day and he has a piece of old oily cardboard, about foot by two foot, or foot and a half. And he said, now look Leo, that's how big the hole has to be in the hood. And he put it on the hood where it had to be. So I just drew a line around and that's where, you're, that's where the hole's gotta be, look. Now I'd just been to the States shortly before that and um, it turns out that uh, Corvette, we're, still, we're, do, we're doing some stuff. I always, when I went back to the States, I always went in the Corvette studio, see what they were doing. And they were playing around with a hood scoop that didn't have an opening at the front because the high pressure area for, would, would be at the back. You know, the air would be hit the windshield and they could suck it in that way and there was less drag. Because if, if Harry didn't like it, I'd have to make another one, but he was in a hell of a hurry for it. So we worked all night, I made the hood scoop, and uh, Harry comes in the next day, and I explained to him what I was doing before I showed it to him, and he got it right away. And he said, okay, Leo, that's it. So it was just as simple as that. In response to Holden's digs at Falcon's handling prowess, Ford released a hard-hitting TV commercial. Check out these brave guys. Between them, these six professional racing drivers have won just about everything worth winning in Australian motorsport. They came to the Ford high-speed test track today to prove a point. This is a production model 78 Falcon 500. Now, Falcon suspension is matched to high-quality steel belt radial tires and is engineered for smooth ride as well as for handling. The Falcon is now traveling at over 90 kilometers per hour. Once again, and the point we're making is that no matter how a car looks when it's driven around witches' hats, it's how a car performs when your life's at stake that really counts. We never felt better about Falcon. And Falcon never felt better. But things were getting tougher for Australian car manufacturing, even with the protection of high import tariffs. It was becoming increasingly difficult to compete on a cost per unit basis, servicing a population of only 14 million people, against the enormous scale of Japan's global exports and newer robotic technologies. As a result, smaller players like Renault and Peugeot fell by the wayside. Also coming to an end in Melbourne were the last of the locally assembled Ramblers at AMI. Chrysler Australia was battling heavy losses with ineffective facelifts of its ageing Valiant. However, in 1977, new buyers started to embrace another Mitsubishi-designed Chrysler badge creation called the Sigma. You know what? 
Even my dad had one. A luxurious mid-sized four-cylinder sedan that won widespread praise and replaced the Galant on local production lines. Even so, Chrysler seemed to be surfing its final wave. At one stage, the Mitsubishi Sigma was the top-selling four-cylinder car in Australia by a country mile. Um, it had the style, it was very well made, engineering-wise it was very, very good because basically Mitsubishi is an engineering company. Um, and Chrysler did extremely well with that car. In response to the global fuel crisis of the 1970s and a trend towards smaller cars, in 1978, Holden took a bold step in downsizing to the new Commodore as its family car future. With a blend of airy, sharp edge European styling and proven Australian engine and components, Australian buyers embraced the new look Holden, particularly after it conquered the gruelling 20,000 kilometre Repco Round Australia trial, with Brocky leading home a crushing 1-2-3 victory for the Red Lion. You know, we were worried about the size of the Commodore. It was all right fore and aft. It had as much leg room and headroom as, as, as the Ford product. But when you sit in the car, the Ford had a bloody console that was two feet wide, and the Commodore was about six inches wide. And you could see that right away. And we were worried that people who wanted a big family car, that was going to show really badly. And uh, so, you know, as I say, we just were went through time after time after time trying to uh, figure out what we could do to get make the Commodore a success. I think because we did on the styling we did the SLE with as much pizzazz as we could get on it. So here you could buy a regular Falcon that had lots of room or you could buy an SLE with all the bells and whistles on it. And uh, that, that really, you know, that was the image we projected. And I think that, that was one of the things that helped get the Commodore going. In October 1972, the XA ZF Falcon and Fairlane models were introduced to the Australian public. About that time, we started planning the replacement range of vehicles to take us into the 1980s. These cars would be different, smaller, lighter, technologically advanced, but maintaining a Ford family resemblance. Holden wasn't alone with its European inspiration for the 1980s. Ford also embraced a distinctive new look for its handsome XD Falcon. However, it was larger than the Commodore in all the key dimensions. With some razor-sharp marketing, Ford made sure that Aussie families would see the new Holden as being too small. These great motor cars of the world have provided inspiration for our designers and engineers in developing our new family car for Australia. Introducing new Ford Falcon GL, a world-class family car without a world-class price from just $6,600. You know, once the, the fuel crisis waned and the prices came back down, you know, people, Australians still wanted a large car, a large family car. And one thing Ford did so well from a marketing point of view was they marketed that you could have a big car which could have the fuel economy that would actually shame some smaller cars. Very clever marketing because then people thought, well, hang on, why should I be crammed into a smaller car? So, again, the battle lines between Ford and Holden were drawn as a new decade dawned. But Aussie car manufacturing was about to face even stronger headwinds. Holden gambles on the smaller Commodore while Ford goes large. The last ever Chrysler Valiant makes way for Sigma and Magna. We find out why Holden parted ways with Peter Brock. Plus a government blueprint to safeguard local production that has Fords dressed as Nissans and Holden's dressed as Toyotas. <laughs> <laughs>